Good morning. A little boy was lost during the Christmas shopping rush. He was standing in an aisle of a busy department store, crying out, Mommy! Mommy! I want my mommy! Where's my mommy? People kept passing by, giving the unhappy little youngster change to ride the ice cream truck that was set up. And so he would ride it, get off, and cry again, Mommy! Mommy! I want my mommy! And so they would continue to give him money to keep him from crying. Finally, a clerk came over to him and said, Oh, oh, sweetie, I know where your mommy is. Here, come with me, son. I'll show you. The little boy looked up and tears drenched down his eyes. And he said, So do I. So just keep quiet. The world is just like this little boy in this illustration. Looking for ways to show that it's, that it's right. And it deserves what we have. It deserves our attention, our time, our money, and whatever else we have, and to prove it in any way necessary. And this includes in the way of deception, if need be. The concern is this, that there's a battle for our attention, our time, our money, our appreciation towards the world. But that Christians are working hard in this battle to give excuse for the sins that they are partaking in. All in the name of God would want to see me happy. God wants it this way. To justify their actions which have been approved and encouraged by the world. And like I said, this is often in ways done through deception. The other day I woke up, I turned on my phone and began running through my emails. Looking at them as I always do, determining which ones needed immediate attention. And which I could wait and which I could delete. When I read a headline that peaked my interest. So naturally... I chose to open the email, and as I began to read the, read the letter, I began to see how easily someone with the skill to write well, and someone who, uh, that, who knew the Bible, could write an article that if you know the Bible enough, and you know how to write well enough, you can affirm homosexuality. He knew the Bible passages, at least to some degree, enough to argue his point. And for the author... He even used Jesus' character to appeal to his cause. And as I read that article, I was reminded that if we are not grounded and rooted in Scripture, we too can be deceived. We can be persuaded to believe a lie. For in this article, the main point was brought out that it is not whom you love in a marital couple relationship, but rather that you love them well. That, is what he went on, was the purpose of Christ's ministry. Well, is there some truth in what the author said? Absolutely. We are to love our spouses well. However, the deception is in the first part of his quote. It does not matter whom you love and have physical intimacy with. Do you see what the author has done here? He was right in what he wrote to a degree, but then he twisted it just enough that some Christians may have now become convinced of what he had said was right. And therefore, if this author were correct, then God would have no issue with homosexuality. That homosexuality would not be a sin. But that rather God saw homosexuality as just another relationship resembling that between God and his children. When in fact we can find multiple verses that condemn the homosexual lifestyle. uh, Deception. Deception. What an interesting word. This morning we want to look at deception in the end times. And as we begin, I right away want to uh, tell you that as we consider the end times in that conversation... The end times is right away. It was moments after Jesus ascended into heaven the day of ascension. That's when the end times began. Today we are ever inching forward to the return of Christ as we read read two weeks ago as we celebrated Pentecost. Pentecost, the day Jesus in the form of the Holy Spirit came down to the twelve disciples and changed the world forever. Thus, we begin this morning with the word of the Lord as we look on the topic of deception. 
And who is the one who, ca- who, who causes or turns people to deceive? That's the first question. It's none other than Satan. Satan, the father of lies. He is good at deceiving. He may imply that he cares for you. He may say that it's not that bad when it comes to sin in our lives. Or that God will forgive. So go ahead and do it. But the reality is, if you don't know Christ, he doesn't want you to know Christ. And for he wants nothing more than to fill hell with as many of God's creation as possible. And if you've accepted Christ as your Lord, he wants to use you to draw you away from God and others away from God and make you thus deemed ineffective for doing God's will. So how does he do that? Well, we're going to look at the first sin. Shortly after God created heaven and earth and man. And it's right then that we read that God set a tree called the tree of good and evil in the garden. And that Adam and Eve were to tend and where God would meet with them. With Adam and Eve. In the garden. But Satan wanted anything but God to have that relationship with his children. So what does Satan do? He deceives Eve. Into believing that sin isn't that bad. And he began to put doubt into Eve's mind. And so we're going to look at Genesis 3 verse 1. B. We're going to look at the whole passage a little bit later. But for now, Genesis 3 verse 1. B. So how does Satan approach Eve? Let's look at that first. That conversation. Satan goes, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Do you see what the devil's trying to do? It's not, did God say not to eat of the tree of good and evil? No. Did God really say don't eat of any tree in the garden? When we, fought, when we let doubt fill our minds, we open the door for Satan to spell and dispel lies into our hearts. When we question God's word, just as Satan was questioning uh, God's word or, or putting it as a question to Eve, we go down a very slippery slope, a very dangerous path. And our thoughts that come to our minds, they could be like, God is a loving God. He won't really mind if I indulge in this sin and you fill in the blank. Or I read how Jesus said that not even that to even think about another woman with lust in the eyes is adultery. But, but women on the internet, they're not really women, are they? People don't understand the situation I'm in. It's hard. This isn't really that bad. God will understand, won't he? I, I promise I'll stop. But, but, but God will let me do it just once. I'll just try it. Or we find loopholes, or we look for loopholes in Scripture to make feeding a craving less of guilt and more of satisfaction. These are the thoughts that enter our minds to justify the actions if we allow doubt and deceit into our hearts. If we allow deception into our hearts, we open a big door. Therefore, it's imperative to see God in all things, especially in those times when we must turn to God for his strength and wisdom in the battle of deception. We're not going to be able to do it alone, and God has given us the strength to do it, to deal with it, and even in the most tempting situations. For the devil has an idea of when we are most weakest. And to make sure that we are listening to the right voice. Because there will be different voices that will come upon us. For Satan is the great deceiver and he can be a sweet talker. And so God has given us tools. And we're going to look at them next uh, three weeks from now I guess. As we um, look at avoiding deception in our lives. But let's look at the whole conversation between serpent and Eve. Genesis 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? 
The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. Do you see it? The woman did tell the serpent the truth. God said, we are not to eat of the tree in the middle of the garden. And he did say, do not touch it or you will die. God knew that to even touch of the tree was to partake of. Uh, was a part of the temptation. So he said, don't eat it, but don't even touch it. What a truth, even into, for us today. We know God has said, this isn't healthy for you, so leave it alone. Don't even pick up the book and read the back of the cover. You know that God doesn't want you to read it. Leave it alone. You know talking to this person is going to give you thoughts of unhealthy and unrighteous, lustful images and relationships Leave it alone. Walk away. God knows better than we know ourselves. He puts the Holy Spirit in us to warn us in advance. To avoid the hurts, the bad decisions that lead to sin. But then look at how the serpent replies. You will certainly, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, you won't be punished. There won't be any serious consequences to your actions. But rather, you'll really begin to live. There's something missing in your life. And you're going to have some fantastic, great experiences. See how Satan used the things that that were desirous to the woman to entice her? You will be like God. You also notice that before Satan touted Eve, she was content. It doesn't say she was walking around grumbling and complaining, man, I wish we weren't in the Garden of Eden. Man, I wish God wouldn't have given us all this work to do. Nothing like that. She was happy. She was content. But when she began to listen to the serpent, she considered herself at a loss. Until, she, until that moment, she believed she had everything she needed. But after she began talking to the snake, a new unhealthy longing began to grow. And this is how it is in our relationships as well. When we are grateful to God for what he's given us, when we, when, when we are happy about the fact that he's protected us uh, from things, he's provided for us, our hearts are content. But when we begin to let discontent, greed, lust, envy, malice into our lives. Kind of like the serpent and how he influenced Eve's thoughts. We too begin to listen to the conversation of the devil. Just look at how the serpent spoke further. You will know good and evil. Who wanted to be like God in the first place? Satan. And that is why he was thrown out of heaven. Because he wanted to overpower God. And after doubt, there's denial. So look at this conversation. And now as he's enticing Eve into believing that disobedience towards God was not really disobeying at all. What do you mean it's that God would do this to you? He's still, he's planted a seed. This reminds me of uh, when my children, we love to eat this candy called live wire, sour live wire. They love to eat that stuff. They would crunch and nibble on a few and, and give me a scrunched up face. And then they'd offer me one. Here, Dad, Dad, try one. It tastes great. Come on, Dad. And I would go, no, I don't think so. No, Dad, come on. This is like the actions that the servant went to Eve with. Come on, just try it. It's not really that bad. God didn't say you weren't supposed to, did he? In the same way my children tried the effects, to hide the effects of the, the live wire sour candy, Satan tries to hide the effects of the consequences of sin. You know, I'm reminded, actually, I was going to use another illustration, um, sour Skittles. My children love that. So for this illustration, I was actually going to see if I could reenact it to some degree. And uh, so I bought some and I decided to give them each three and see how they'd respond. Well, one, he went and took, he, I each gave him three. 
So the wine took all three, put them in his mouth, and I wanted to see what sour face looked like again. That's kind of what I wanted to be reminded of. And he scrunched up bad, and he said, Dad, don't ever do three at a time. Nobody should ever do that. And then the next child took one and popped it in their mouth and just kind of crunched up and tried to be quiet and not say much. And then the third one just barely licked it, <laughs> just sucked on it and took it out of his mouth. And it reminded me, the reason I'm saying this is because that's how we sometimes view deception. Sometimes we're all in. We'll take it all. Next time, well, we'll just try a little bit. You know, maybe we'll try one. And next time, maybe I'll just try a lick. Maybe that's enough, you know. Maybe a little lick at a time. But either way, you've given in to deception. If you've given in, you're tasting it. We need to not taste it. We need to stay away from it. So, back to scripture. What does Eve do? Verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. At this point, her concern for how it would affect her relationship with God and her husband was nowhere. She'd forgotten about it. She'd left it alone. And all she, all she could think about was how the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and how it had become desirable and attractive. And now believing Satan that it would open her eyes and gain her wisdom, she couldn't resist it, but she ate from it. And she was deceived. And then what are consequences of deception? Well, it does not end, but will be an influence in those around you. When you are deceived, you're not the only one that's affected by the deception. Look at later, look at 6b. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Just look at these two. Do you see the, see the fear of being found out? Do you see the guilt and the shame for their realizing their nakedness? That's a tactic of Satan, the deceiver. He's a liar. He's deceptive. Deceitful, untrustworthy, devious. But here's a question. After Satan led Eve astray... When God challenged Adam and Eve on what they had done, did Satan step into the conversation and defend Eve? Oh, wait a minute. No, no, no. No, 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 God. Didn't you say that this was... No, none of that. He looks out for number one. It doesn't matter really. He doesn't really care about you. Satan is not out there for our best interests. He's only there for interesting, uh, he's only there for his own interests, himself. Satan knew he'd fed Eve a lie. So when we consider this, it's no surprise that Jesus, many times after Jesus comes to earth, and he's here for 33 years, many times he talks about the warnings of how Satan would be the deceiver and those that would be, would be led by Satan to deceive. It would be used, it would be even using God's word and then giving it a slight shift in the meaning that most would not catch the change. You know, the other day I watched as a spider was making its way to the prey. A fly that was stuck on sticky paper that I had put down on in our garage. And as he was crawling, his eye, uh, as he was crawling along, his eyes were so glued to the food ahead of him that he failed to consider the fact that he was getting stuck on the paper. And so he'd be walking along, getting a little sticky, sticky, sticky. He made it to the fly. But it cost him his life in the process. 
This is what deception does. It tricks you into forgetting about the consequences of the action, the consequences of the sin. It tricks you into losing sight of the penalty of sin. And it convinces you that you are most important. You are deserving of getting what you want. You are deserve of something better. And you deserve it. And no matter the cost, you should get it. Just like the spider. Mark 13, 5. His disciples are asked about when the things would come to be accomplished. Which he spoke about the end time. When Jesus spoke about the end times. He says... He warns him, he says, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And then in verse 9b, he says, be on your guard. Why are we to be on our guard? Because many will be deceived. If your Bibles turn to 2 Corinthians 11, 12 to 15. Paul speaking to the Corinthians. He talks about how Satan is the masquerade. He masquerades himself as an angel of light. And how there will be those as well, false prophets that will do the same. As they deceive. And I will keep on doing, Paul says. And I will keep on doing what I am doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they are to boast about. For such people are false prophets, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles for, of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is no surprise then if his servants are also masqueraded as servants of righteousness. They were phonies. And then Paul says their end will be what their actions deserve. Paul's days, there were those who were boasting about their involvement in ministry. They were saying how great they were, how good, they, how good a job they were doing, the amazing things that God was doing through them. And yet they, were being, they had been deceived, and they were deceiving and misleading people into a different gospel than what Christ was. And in their boasting and their righteousness with God, they were, they were deceiving people, but at the same time, they were receiving much attention. Paul, on the other hand, knowing that through this deception, people may have interest in, in uh, receiving glory as well. He warns the reader. He warns the people in Corinth. And he reminds them, that this is sin. Floating in ourselves is sin. And there are consequences to our actions when we gloat in ourselves and when we preach our own gospel. And God will deal with them. When we look at Jesus and we see the Paul, uh, speaking of the false prophets, Matthew 7 verse 15 to 20 Jesus talks about how false prophets will come, deceivers, deception will hit us. False prophets will be dressed as in sheep's clothing, but they'll be ferocious wolves. Say, so watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. By their fruit you will recognize them. This is to be a clear indication of knowing whether a person has received Christ and repented of their sins. You will recognize them by their fruits. How have they responded to their past sins? Have they been sorry, remorseful, seeking forgiveness? Have they taken a 180 turn? Have they finally said, no more of this sin? Have they made a deliberate change in their attitude in serving Christ rather than serving themselves? To make God first in their lives and all else second. This is how you'll know. For those who have come to Christ will produce good fruit. And the most important question is, are they acknowledging the gospel of Christ? 
Are they true Christians? You will know it by their fruit. 2 Peter 3, 16 and 17. Peter says this when concluding after having spoken on what will take place on the Lord's day. An encouragement for each one of us as we are bombarded with deception in many forms. He says, so then dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, this is of course the Lord's day when Christ will come again. Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him, him being God. Bear in mind that our Lord's patient means Patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you in wisdom that God gave. He writes the same things in his letter, all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. In other words, they're deceiving because they want to make it seem as though they know what they're doing. Therefore, they're going to make it out in their own Uh, interpretation rather than following through in what the true interpretation would be. Continuing on, 17. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. Secure position as Christians following Christ. But grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be both glory for now and forever. Amen. In Christ, we're looking forward to that great day when Jesus comes again to take us home to be with him. Therefore, Peter tells us, remain focused not on the desires that lead to sin. Because when we focus on the desires that lead to sin, we will be more easily deceived. That's when we're deceived mostly and more likely. And we let our guard down when we start looking at the things. If we start looking at the ice cream and we want to lose weight and we say, I, will, I don't want to... Um, I don't want to eat ice cream, but you're seeing the ice cream in the fridge every day, every day. And you're going, I don't want that because I want to lose weight. And finally you go, but I see it there. And eventually what happens? Well, I can tell you firsthand that (laughs) ice cream pail is empty. Why? Because I kept looking at it. Therefore, Peter says, remain focused not on the desires that lead to sin in this world. But on the living, but living a life of spotless, blameless, and at peace with God kind of an attitude. Work to be, to have a spotless, blameless, and peaceful life with God. Not perfect, but to be focused on God. Remain focused on Him. Not on the lifestyle the world is living and indulging in. And because Paul wrote some of these things that are most difficult to understand, there will be those who will use the scriptures and attempt to, they may be, to deceive and mislead other people so that it's easier to make them believe it because they themselves don't know exactly what it means. And then Paul says this will lead to destruction. Therefore, be on guard, be well into the word, study it, grow in grace and knowledge. So keep feeding on the word. That's what it's about. Feed on the word. Listen to the word. I know some that are now, every morning, they turn on their, their uh, on, on the, now it's so easy to uh, listen to the word of God that you can just turn your CD player or your iPod or your phone or whatever on and just let the word absorb in you. Listen to it. Reading it is great too, but however you desire it. But lead, Get yourself exposed to the word. Keep feeding on the word. The other day I heard a speaker talk about the importance of having regular prayer and scripture reading as a family. Taking that time. Growing up, I recall every evening at supper table coming Father's Day next week. um, I was reflecting on what my dad has done and kind of being an influence in my life. And at the supper table, he made sure that every day we read one page from the Bible. And then we read on our daily bread. The one for that day as well. I can't say our lives are perfect, but I can tell you that um, it's made a difference in my life growing up and even today. So I want to challenge us to read your Bible and pray daily. That same speaker then said that Charles Wesley's mom had 19 children. 19 children! Kelvin, could you imagine having 19 children? (laughs) 19 children! And they had a small home. 
Could you imagine a small crowd at home and trying to find a place to read your Bible or to pray? Well, she was creative, and, and the speaker went on to say that her place of for her to pray, uh, a time of prayer, was by using her cooking apron, putting it over her head. And when those children saw that her cooking apron was over her head, that meant leave mom alone for those few minutes because she is praying. We need to be finding time and taking it seriously. Time of prayer. Because if we don't, we will be led astray. We will be deceived. So no matter how busy or crowded your household is, there's always a place and a time for prayer. There needs to be that time to pray. For this is how we can help being deceived. Help from being deceived. And next week we're going to be looking at part three. Several points in how to prevent ourselves from being deceived. But for today, I just want to encourage each one here this morning that even when we are deceived, thankfully the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross for each one of us. And that if we have been deceived, we can go to him and say, Lord, I have been deceived. But Lord, I want to make it right. I want to be forgiving. I want to make things right. and I want want it rectified, Lord. And thankfully, he has gone to the cross, and every sin we ask for forgiveness has already been paid for, and we can walk in newness of life when we do that. When we pray that prayer, we can be renewed. We can be forgiven, and the weight of that sin can be lifted. Consequences of sin might still be there, but the weight of the sin can be lifted. So therefore, thank you, Lord, for helping us to understand what deception is, Thank you also that when we uh, are exposed to it, that you have given us the Holy Spirit to uh, filter through what needs to be dealt with. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you at the close of the service. We thank you that you promised to be with us through the gift of the Holy Spirit. May, you find a, may we find a time and a place to read from your word and to spend time with you daily in prayer. And as a day draws ever near to your second coming and knowing that Satan would see us ineffective in being an encouragement to others and in being used to bring people to Christ. And so he will do his best to deceive many. Lord, we pray that you would give us the wisdom and the strength and the knowledge and understanding to know what is truth and to trust in you. May you lead us and guide us in all things. Amen.